Good morning. Uh, this is a very, very exciting event. I want to first just thank you all for, for joining us on this Saturday morning. I know this is a, a global event, so uh, for, for some of you in the, in the evening. Um, this is UN uh, 101, Roadmap to Working with the United Nations. Um, I'm Robert Rittberger, and uh, I'm part of, of, of the PGA, and um, this is a, a UN and PGA event, but we're also uh, you know, have, have people from the Writers Guild and the Directors Guild, and, and so it's really fantastic to, to have uh, the whole, whole community together to really see, uh, to learn more about the UN and to learn more about uh, what we call social impact entertainment, uh, but more on that later. Um, the event will be broken up into four parts. Uh, the first is um, the UN and current challenges, uh, how content creators and film and TV work with the UN, uh, and case studies in film and, and TV collaboration, uh, followed by a Q&A and, and, uh, and wrap up. Um, as we go through, um, you can put your questions in the uh, Q&A section at the bottom of Zoom. Um, it's different from the chat, so just make sure that uh, you're putting it in the right place, and, and then at the very end, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take those questions and respond to them. Um, there's a couple objectives here and, and goals, but I think at the very, Foremost, it's to demystify the United Nations, that uh, these are people, you know, passionate as, as we are about filmmaking, uh, that are, are really doing e exceptional work. Um, and they, too, are looking to connect with the general public, uh, looking to amplify their messaging. And we as filmmakers, you know, can be a, a tremendous uh, a vehicle for that. And so, you know, this is really, I, I like to think when you, when you begin to act, you, you find your uh, you find your fellow allies, and so you, you know this is step one with with uh, an introduction. But we hope that you, you know you reach out, um, that you connect, and uh, and you you kind of step back and and see with what you're working on, or um, e even the projects you've done in the past, how it might connect up uh, in, in this in this larger piece. Um, because we are all filmmakers, there's two films I wanted to to bring up. Um, uh, Preston Sturge's uh, Sullivan's Travels, an older film, 1941, but it, it really speaks to the uh, inherent um, good of, of entertainment, um, that it, it's so much to, to lift us up, to give us hope, um, uh, you know, brief moments of escape to, um, uh, to, to come back to life and, and, and be more, you know, uh, have more vitality and, and be, be closer to the, to the ones that we love. And then the other film is, is um, Frank Capra's You Can't Take It With You. And I think for so much of us in this time of, of upheaval and uh, you know, what we thought was uh, a career you know, that, that maybe had to be fine-tuned or, or put on pause, it, it reminds us that uh, sometimes the highest good is, um, is what we give back uh, and, and what we, what we you know, leave for others. And so it, it's really with that lens that, um, yeah, that, that you know, we, we uh, will meet the people on this call and, and, and take a look at, um, at impact. So it's, it's as much an entertainment um, as, as it also is uh, as impact. And um, yeah, I, I think across the spectrum, you, you know, it's, it's all great. And, um, and so, yeah, we're very, very excited to, to welcome you all. Um, Let's see, so, so now from the, from the UN, I'm really honored to, to welcome uh, Melissa Fleming. She's the Under Secretary General for Global Communications. Uh, she took the position uh, September of last year. And then before that, she was UNHCR uh, Head of Global Communications and spoke per spokesperson to the High Commissioner. Um, at UNHCR, she led global media outreach campaigns, social media engagement, and a multimedia news service to distribute and place stories designed to generate empathy and stir action for refugees. Uh, she's also a, um, a frequent uh, uh, guest on platforms, um, is a TED speaker uh, and author. Um, she wrote a, a Hope More Powerful Than the Sea um, and is a host of the award-winning podcast, Awake at Night. Uh, Ms. Fleming joined UNHCR from the International Atomic Energy uh, agency where she served for eight years as spokesperson and head of the media, uh, head of media and outreach. Uh, prior to that, she headed the, the press and public information team at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And earlier still, she was public affairs specialist in Radio Free Europe, 
uh, in Munich, having started her career as a journalist. Um, from 2006 to 2007, she also served as senior advisor and spokesperson on uh, the incoming U uh, UN Secretary General's transition team. Uh, she holds a uh, master's in science and journalism from uh, College Communication uh, at Boston University and a Bachelor of Arts in German Studies from Oberlin College. Ms. Fleming, thank you so much for taking the time. And um, yeah, very exciting to, to put people in, in uh, the, the UN space in touch with, with uh, entertainers. It's, it's really not often that, um, that this community uh, finds an intersection point and, and really grateful to, to you and the UN for, for, uh, and the PGA for, for helping all facilitate this. Well, well, thanks. Thanks, Robert. And um, thanks for that really kind uh, introduction. I think, as you probably heard from, from introducing me, my, I've worked for international organizations my entire career. And I've really made a point of trying to, um, you know, translate very complex um, institutions and the work of, uh, you know, building peace and security and human rights, et cetera, you know, to, to average people. And so we need, and we've always needed uh, storytelling. Um, I'm just a big fan of storytelling to build that bridge um, of, uh, you know, understanding, knowledge, empathy um, to, to the general public. So I think we all have have the same goal. And that's why I'm, I'm really, really grateful um, for your interest in the United Nations and in this, um, in this opportunity. I think you are, I, I'm supposed to give a kind of uh, United Nations 101, which I'll attempt to do. It, it's not very easy um, in a few minutes, but um, I think probably most of you know a bit, but I'd like to just start with, with um, a quote that I think most UN staff kind of carry in their hearts and it's displayed big in the UN Secretary General and it's by um, the second, in the Secretariat, the second UN Secretary General, Doug uh, Hammarskjöld, who um, died very tragically during his second term in a plane crash over the then uh, Rhodesia. And he said, the United Nations was not created in order to take mankind to heaven but to save humanity from hell. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, we'd like to be able to take mankind to heaven, but um, really uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a body that is working, um, as it says in its um, charter that was created exactly 75 years ago this year um, to end the scourge of war. So just remember the UN was born 75 years ago out of the ashes of World War II um, and um, in, in, in um, not far from where you are in San Francisco, um, and we're celebrating our 75th birthday this year um, mm -hmm. and celebrating, you know, some of the founding principles, which also really emphasized in its charter, um, hu the faith in, in fundamental human rights. And that is, you know, really aspirations to, to um, make sure that, you know, everybody has the, first of all, the principle has the right to education, has the right to equal pay, to equal work, to nationality. Unfortunately, um, you know, not all of these aspirations are realized and the coronavirus pandemic is really like lifting uh, a veil if there, you know, if in places where perhaps people weren't looking um, on the you know real um, problems of this world, um, you know it's not just causing problems, but it's also exposing um, many problems that have to do with not having implemented um, the uh, you know the the principles in the UN Charter, which is uh, all about uh, quality, equality, and justice. Um, so um, yeah, what the UN um, it is really all about, um, you know, confronting um, the problems of, of our, our globe and trying to do that collectively. Um, we all, we throw around the term multilateralism all the time, um, at, especially at a time where we're concerned about, you know, growing kind of uh, um, uh, nationalism, uh, nativist movements. The coronavirus pandemic is also, um, you know, rightly, governments are, are closing their, their borders to 
perhaps uh, you know to, to contain the, the the virus, but you know this is also fueling um, a move away from global co uh, cooperation and collaboration at a time when we actually need it most. So uh, we are very seized as never before um, with all of the issues that are confronting our planet, and that is in the area of, of peace and security. Um, when I joined uh, the UN Secretariat about a year ago, I mean, top, top, top on our agenda was climate action in the face of a, you know, a horrific climate emergency. This has not gone away at all. We may have had a small respite um, because uh, fewer people are flying and, and taking to the roads, but it is, um, it is still uh, an absolute um, frightening problem for our planet. We're pushing sustainable development through the sustainable development goals, um, uh, human rights, disarmament, uh, fighting terrorism. And, um, you know, you mentioned that I just came from working for one of the most foremost uh, humanitarian organizations, really uh, working on the front lines um, of uh, humanitarian action um, in places around the world um, where, uh, where, um, most people um, would not want to work. Um, we're also fighting for gender equality, good governance, and uh, for you know food production. So, how are we structured? Very generally, it's it's complex. Um, but I think what's most widely known, um, New York is obviously the headquarters, um, and here uh, is the seat of the the Secretariat and our department, the Department for Global Communications, is is a department within that Secretariat. But it's also the seat of the the General Assembly. Um, there are 193 member states that belong to that General Assembly. All of them having um, an equal vote, um, no matter how small or rich or poor they are. Um, However, um, as you probably all know, the general power resides uh, elsewhere in the Security Council, which is the most powerful arm of the United Nations um, and has arguably its most important job and that is maintaining global peace and security. Um, the United Nations uh, Security Council can impose sanctions. It can also authorize military intervention and every one of its members have, have veto power. But as you know, there's a lot of criticism of the Security Council. It has virtually remained unchanged since the end of World War II. Um, there are five permanent members, and these are the, those who are the victors of World War II. Right. And there are other 10 members who, who are elected and rotate um, for two-year terms. So for better or for worse, it is the most powerful body. Um, and yet we still have been experiencing horrible wars. Um, I worked a, a lot on, on the Syria war and also the, the refugees that resulted from it. And um, that, that, was, uh, that is one of the, probably uh, this, the, the biggest tra tragedy of our age in that sense. Um, um, and then there is the Secretary General, um, who is our boss and who is uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, who is in his first term and his role is, I mean, some say he's really um, the, maybe the global conscience of the world. But he's also supposedly, you know, the, the chief ad administrative offer officer, that's maybe his real job description. But he also serves as a kind of global convener and a global statesman. Mm. Um, you know, beyond, beyond the secretary, and there are many parts of the secretariat, there's a really good explainer on um, UN.org, I think, that really breaks it all down. But we do have uh, a number of, you know, headquarter locations around the world. So we're really represented around the world, uh, country offices in virtually every country in the world. And we have the UN agencies, and many of you have heard of, um, for example, UNICEF or the World Food Program. Um, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees um, that are really uh, working on the front lines um, to serve the most vulnerable people um, in the world. So that's, um, I th I'm, I'm sure I'm leaving a lot out, but it's uh, United Nations 101. I have, I have to say that um, I'm, I'm very, you know, proud to walk in, it used to be to walk into the building every day, now it is. <laughs> to kind of tune in virtually. But um, I think what I'm most proud of um, 
And that's why I, I started the podcast that you mentioned, which is called Awake at Night, um, which mm -hmm. features interviews with UN colleagues who really are at the front line of um, humanitarian response. And right now, the response to the coronavirus, my last interview was with with a, a, a young doctor from WHO um, who was working in the Central African Republic fighting coronavirus. And before that, she was fighting Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, meanwhile, her two sons, um, one 21 and the other 16, are alone in Spain. And you would think Spain would be fine, but it was Spain during coronavirus where the most dramatic, one of the most dramatic situations where um, nobody was permitted outside of their homes. So very dramatic um, stories um, and backstories from the people who serve, but they're serving because this is what they, they believe they want to make the world a better place. And I think we all feel proud of that. I think very often we feel like um, the UN is under-recognized and over-criticized. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why we are, you know, need partners uh, like you to help us better tell the UN story. We'll leave it at that. Well, thank, yeah, thank you so much for that. And, and I think, you know, collectively, there's, there's so many kind of problems facing the world these days that, um, that we all kind of ask, you know, are, are we doing enough? Is, are, is our work having enough of an impact? And, um, and that's why I think, you know, talks like these and, and you know, alliances like these are, are, are so important because it's really, you know, what the UN sort of brought me to is, is this expression of build back better. And, um, you know, it is certainly it's in, inherent in, in the UN of build back better together. Um, but I, I, you know, definitely a, a, across um, platforms so, so people can, so we can reach as many as possible. Um, with, with that, I, let's, let's pivot, um, talk a little bit about the communication of the, the messages and, and, at, at, uh, and then in the chat, we'll, um, uh, we'll be posting a, a, a handout that has a little bit more about the UN. Um, but yeah, if, if we can queue up this clip and then I'll, I'll ask my, my question. But what you were looking at was a um, uh, basically a, a way to to expand communications of, of the UN. So, Ms. Fleming, you're, you're particularly responsible to communicate the messages the UN wants the world to hear, understand, and act on. Uh, what what are the current communication challenges you're you're facing today? Yeah. Well, um, our communication strategy is um, I we. We have designed it around what I call the three W's of cause communications, um, because we are we are communicating uh, not just to inform, but we're con communicating to capture people's imaginations and get people to act. Mm. So the three W's are what, what is taking the science, taking the information, the good solid information, and making sure it gets to people. But the second W is why care. And that is where you know we have to think about who is the audience we're trying to reach and why should they care about this information we want them to receive. Um, and that requires you know steps to think about how to communicate that information to get them to care, to get them to feel, to get them to feel. Um, and then the third W is what now? Once mm -hmm. we have taken them on that journey, do capture their imaginations, their hearts, their compassion, um, persuade that then, then what now, what are we going to ask them to do? Um, so it's, at, it's astonishing. I think, you know, there are so many noble institutions that really only stay with the, the first W. Mm -hmm. uh, they think we have so much good information. We have the science. And particularly when you think about um, what's happening now with, with COVID-19, um, we have found that on, on social media, and there have been studies, um, for example, on YouTube, um, you know, twenty-five percent of the YouTube videos on the coronavirus are full of inf uh, misinformation or uh, wild conspiracy theories. Uh, there are, there is plenty of good information that is being uploaded by the likes of WHO, the UN, uh, national health uh, institutions. It's just that the information is dull. It's not compelling. It is, um, it's not just not very entertaining. Whereas the, um, the purveyors of misinformation, and we're seeing this wildly uh, on most social media platforms, are 
are becoming, um, you know, fabulous producers of, of viral uh, content. I think may, many of you probably uh, heard or, or read about or even um, looked at that this video called Plandemic um, that was very slickly produced and full of misinformation and conspiracies. And yet it was shared something like 8 million times. I mean, the WHO uh, and we would love to have that kind of uh, viewership and those kind of figures. So it, it's really important for us to really take that step of, um, you know, helping to, you know, to really make sure our content is, um, is, is reaching people. And, and we, so we have to, you know, be as clever as those who are trying to deliver um, bad information, misinformation, falsehoods. Um, this is our, I think, probably the biggest challenge uh, we've ever faced, the biggest communications challenge, because we are in um, the first global pandemic in the social media age, um, in the age where social media has uh, a reach that is, um, you know, just unimaginable in every corner of the world. This could be a benefit because you could you know, if you could reach people with good guidance and good health information, you could really make a difference. However, um, what what is happening is that all of the bad information um, is confusing people. It's uh, leading people to take um, bad decisions. It's even risking people's lives. I mean, there was a recent study um, that came out that's that believes that at least 800 people died in the first three months of the pandemic because they believed false information and thousands and thousands and thousands injured took took crazy fake cures i mean i'm sure that isn't even you know i think the number is probably higher so mm -hmm. we started an initiative um called verified um and it is uh we're working with um a fa fantastic um social good communications company called Purpose. Um, and there, and we, we have, um, as the Secretary General said, we're, we're working to kind of flood the internet with good information that has been socially optimized um, for sharing. Mm. Um, and we've also started a, a, a kind of what we, a recruitment of what we're calling um, information volunteers, kind of like digital first responders. Hmm. Um, who sign up online, receive a, a daily email from us, and are given the kind of education and the tools to, to understand misinformation when they see it, to educate their communities, because misinformation penetrates um, in, in not, you, you can't solve it by broadcasting, you can solve it by penetrating groups on, on social media. Um, and so, so that's, that's another way. And then our Finally, our, our um, next endeavor um, is going to be working on building vaccine confidence. Um, we want to tell the exciting story, uh, the positive story of vaccines over time um, at a time when um, the anti-vaccine movement um, is growing where people are becoming extremely worried about the speed. I mean, this is from the left and from the right, um, different aspects of a future COVID-19 vaccine. We have a big concern that we will, um, the world will reach uh, this one of the biggest solutions to get out of this pandemic. And that is to have a safe and reliable vaccine that is um, delivered equitably and cheaply um, but not enough people will agree to take it um, because they've been hearing um, and because of the fear that they feel um, because of what they're reading. Yeah. So yes, we have a, a number of issues. This is our, our big focus right now, but of course we're also continuing to promote and you, you said Build Back Better. In fact, uh, Joe Biden has also <laughs> taken Build Back Better as his slogan. So it seems that um, it's, it's becoming quite popular. But we believe right now is an opportunity to start again delivering the messages that we were trying to get out before. And that is um, 
that we have a blueprint for a better world. And the blueprint is the sustainable development goals. Mm. Um, they already exist. They're cool. They're fantastic. If, if they were implemented in every country, the world would be a, a much better place. And one of the biggest issues, you know, within uh, is, is also um, uh, climate change and climate action. We're making another real big push um, to, you know, it, 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 we were just, you know, with, with uh, Fridays for Future and Greta and the young people of this world finally embracing it and people get, you know, we were just kind of getting there that there was a lot of excitement about change. But now we're seeing a lot of opportunity and we're seeing countries that are potentially going to build back greener. Mm. Um, and we really want to hold them up as examples uh, for others to follow. Mm. So I could go on for the entire workshop, but yeah. I'm going to stop there. I do not want to dominate at all, well, but uh, yeah. Yeah, this was all tremendously, tremendously valuable and, and, um, and, and really your, your passion for, for making a difference shines through. So really, really appreciate you, you coming and, and, and sharing with us about the UN and, um, and also, you know, you, you, you bring it forward as a very, you know, accessible uh, open system, which, which, you know, I, I've been, uh, working with working with the UN on, on film projects for about seven eight years and, and I've found to be the case too so it, it thank you again for for sharing your your, your insight and um, and we'll close on a uh, another clip um, the, the previous minions clip is available in the chat if people want to see that with the video um, and uh, hopefully we will um, have video on this next clip so we'll transition to that thanks a lot Robert Thank you. Uh, next, I, I'd like to uh, introduce a, a great friend of mine and, and, and colleague at the, um, the Social Impact Entertainment Task Force, uh, Mr. William Nix. Um, and he's gonna talk about how, con how content creators in film and TV work with the UN, uh, along with an overview of what uh, social impact entertainment is. Um, and uh, so, yeah, take, take it over, Will, thanks so much. I'd like to go back and to introduce Mr. Maher Nasser. And Mr. Nasser uh, is the uh, Director of Outreach in the UN uh, Department of Global Communications. Uh, Maher, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your division that you direct uh, and uh, how you uh, work uh, with the creative community in outreach? Thank, thank you very, very much, William, and thank you all for being with us on a Saturday, Saturday morning. I know it's uh, one thing we're working from home, that it that doesn't mean that we, we don't get a weekend. We do, and you should, uh, but we, we really appreciate the fact that, that you are with us on, 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 on this day. Uh, the, the United Nations actually work with creative community is not new. It used to be through working with celebrities, through the Goodwill Ambassadors, Messengers of Peace. Historically, UNICEF was one of the first organizations to appoint a Goodwill Ambassador. And contrary to common belief, North by Northwest was not filmed at the United Nations. The UN was sort of like closed, seeing that it's too serious to have films being uh, filmed in its own premises. The first time was 2004 with the interpreter. When Kofi Annan uh, authorized uh, the filming to take place at the UN. And that was the first time that an actual uh, Hollywood major production took place inside the building. And with, it, with that, people got to see what happens inside the building, not through documentary, not through the news, but also through uh, the characters and a feature story. Uh, that was more or less, could have been the last time, but in late, 2010, uh, the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon at the time, I think, started, agreed that we could open the doors more. And there was an encouragement for us to create a film office, a film office in the same way that would be in the city, that would facilitate production uh, inside, filming inside the UN, access to experts, access to archival material. But we wanted to take it one step further. It isn't enough to just facilitate filming at the UN. We also thought, and I think here, we looked at the model of the Hollywood Health and Society, that sometimes soft messaging and storytelling is more impactful in a way long-term on people's lives and perceptions than, than a documentary or science that could be flying over people's heads. Uh, similar to, if you look, a, and I remember, 
I mean, I guess we all remember in the 70s and the 80s, major, and no, no film, no television did not have characters smoking. And smoking was seen as something that's very cool. And young people were impression, you know, impressionist, you know, take that. And then, then you want to be like we see on the cinema. Uh, most of my generation were smoking smokers because, you know, they saw the Marlboro Man and they saw this in the film and television. Uh, now you don't see that. And, and there's a major advance because, again, uh, the work of what you spoke about, William, and the PGA's work and social, uh, I think, collectively producers, uh, the work of Hollywood Health and Society, uh, Norman Lear and others, we don't see smoking. And I think now everybody realizes it, it is bad for health. So the same way we wanted to work with the creative industry to, to bring issues such as climate action, climate change, uh, inequality, uh, and now of course the biggest and most ambitious agenda, which is the SDGs, uh, to everybody's uh, awareness and and therefore uh, inspiring them to take action and to be committed, not just through documentaries and through access and films at the UN and interviews with senior UN officials and experts, but actually through stories that reflect the diversity and wealth of experiences that exist in the United Nations. I learned my English from television. I went to schools run by the United Nations as a refugee. And for me, the world the television was my world into the world that I couldn't travel to. Today, people have that in their pocket. The, they're always younger generation, uh, gen, millennial, generation Z. I mean, the, you have the iPhone or, or Android or whichever device, and that's where they're looking at. And they're not just looking at major productions, but that's the power of stories, the power of uh, little uh, examples, vignettes. That's where we want to sure to 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 make sure that that also reflects what we do at the United Nations. So what what we do is we work with uh, and we have had uh, long m multiple cooperations with Sony Entertainment and others, uh, Angry Birds, and and the rationale behind that is that reaching audiences that aren't necessarily coming to us, but through the storytelling, building on what Melissa was saying in terms of. Uh, stories have more impact and, and I think more uh, more entertaining way of getting information in a soft way that isn't in your face because I remember the first time Ban Ki-moon came to Hollywood uh, and I was with him in 2011 one of the things that writers and producers were telling us in the room was you know the UN is too earnest and we don't want stories and films and you know we can't all be that you know that we leave that to you but but we do have interesting stories. The UN is in the field. We have 110,000 peacekeepers. We have people defending human rights. We have uh, food aid being delivered to 80 million people a day. 50% of the children in the, in the world are being vaccinated through the UNICEF and, and others. Uh, 80 million refugees are, and so on and so forth. So all of that is material for stories, material for content. So that's what we try to do. And we, we are open for business, uh, unfortunately not physically now, but we can do it virtually. So that's, that's in a nutshell what, what we try to do. And, and, and we're, we're very grateful for the collaborations we have already had multiple times from uh, PGA and, and others on this, uh, on this uh, event uh, in, in Los Angeles. And of course, we wouldn't have been able to do that without the support uh, of the UN Foundation. And, and I think that uh, Rajesh Mershinani and, and Danny Zapatosny uh, will, will, will speak about. Thank you. Uh, to summarize then, you're involved with content development, uh, social media campaigns, and on-location filming and facilitating the legal approvals of the UN logo and other purposes uh, as a, among the broad uh, umbrella of services you offer. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Rajesh Mershandani. Uh, and uh, Rajesh, could you tell us a little bit about your, how your career began in the film industry and your work now with the UN Foundation? Sure, yeah. Good morning, everybody. It's very nice to be with you. And hello to my colleagues and friends, Maha and Melissa uh, and Danny Zapatosny, who I work with closely at the UN Foundation. Um, 
I'll, 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 I'll start where we are now and I'll go back a little bit. The UN Foundation was created about 21 years ago by Ted Turner in order to support the UN and UN causes. We're a US registered uh, nonprofit. And you know, we think of our role as really helping to bring the world to the UN and the UN to the world. Um, I joined the UN Foundation from a, a small development think tank in Washington, DC, uh, and where I worked for three years as my first job out of journalism. For, prior to that, for 21 years, I was a BBC journalist based uh, in the UK, Washington, and also in LA for five years, um, covering uh, a huge number of stories and then deploying around the world um, as needed as a foreign correspondent. Uh, my career also encompassed a huge variety of activities within the kind of broad sweep of journalism, not just news, but current affairs, documentary making, a lot of television, radio, online as well, online video. Um, and I did a lot of entertainment work, a lot of entertainment journalism uh, as well, uh, which really gave me a window into the world of the creative community and the world of television and film. And you know that really helped when I was based in LA working for the BBC. I'd cover the Oscars every year and every award ceremony. And we all know what award season is like in LA. It's, it's a bit like working now. It's like, you know, can I please get a weekend off? <laughs> Uh, for about three months of the year. I think we all understand that. Um, but it also made me understand firsthand that, yes, as a journalist, I'm working in storytelling, but it's the producers and directors and the script writers working in television and the film, you are the best storytellers on the planet. And so when we come to you to you know, work on social good stories or imp stories of social impact, we understand that we can't tell you what to say or what to write or how to do it. You know better. And, you know, I think that has been for us really instrumental in our work recently, uh, helping the UN and WHO on, uh, co against COVID-19. Uh, and that's a really important example for us. You know, we, WHO came to us at the very tail end of February. Um, and they said to the foundation, can you help us raise global support uh, around tackling COVID? At that point, the pandemic was spreading really fast around the world, but people didn't realize the potency of it. And it still needed to, they still needed to understand that. I mean, within a couple of weeks that had changed massively. And that's the, the, the nature of this pandemic is just the, the pandemic is changing and the story is changing extremely uh, rapidly. So when WHO came to us, we knew what the basic story was. We knew no one is safe until we are all safe. What is COVID showing us? It's showing us that humanity is only as strong as our weakest. And only WHO, only the UN has the reach to reach everyone. And so that was just the core of it. That, that was it. You know, it wasn't you know, to Maha's point, it wasn't any more earnest than that. I mean, earnest in the sense of it's, it, you know, it comes from the heart, but it wasn't any more wonky. It wasn't any more nuanced. It wasn't any more policy focused. It was simple human story that we depend on each other and we depend on each other in order to defeat this. So with that in mind, within a week, we had built um, uh, a platform, which was the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. Um, and then we pressed go on it on Friday, March the 13th. And then actually after that, we all went remote. That was the last day we were all in the office together. Um, and then we watched it take off in the most extraordinary way. Within six weeks, we raised $200 million. And that money went to WHO to help it lead and coordinate the global response. Why did it take off? Because the story was right and because people understood the basic story and we kept it at a level that people could understand. We saw a huge outpouring of support from people all over the world. Uh, there was a woman in Ireland who set up a GoFundMe page and said, I'm gonna do 8,000, actually it was 4,000 squats if people uh, donate to the fund. And then she doubled it to 8,000 squats. I really hope that she's done some stretching since then. Um, 
we saw a guy creating on a wash your hands wrap, which went viral as well. And then dozens of creative community people, organizations and projects started to come to us. Uh, my personal favorite uh, is the Minions PSA because who doesn't love the Minions? Um, it's a shame we couldn't share the video. I do encourage you to go and see it. But that started because participant media came to us and said, how can we get involved? Um, and they said, oh, by the way, we made Contagion a few years ago as well. And I don't know if you've watched Contagion, um, but William, to, I, your slide with all the different examples of movies that have made an impact, that's basically a two hour public health PSA. It's really great, and really worth watching. Um, so they came to us and said, how can we help? And we said, you know what? You need to do what you do. Here's some messaging. Just if you can incorporate it, that's the right, that's the right messaging. And here's the brand. If you can add that, that would be great. That would help the fund. And they did what they do. And they did it brilliantly because they're the best storytellers. You guys are the storytellers. We saw the same, we took the same approach with so many celebrities, so many projects, so many companies that came, with, came to us. Mr. Bean did a PSA. Rita Ora came to us, Harry Styles did something, Katy Perry did, did something, Taylor Swift crashed our fun site when she talked about it. Um, keep that between ourselves, please. Um, uh, Queen and Adam Lambert, you will remember in the early in the summer, uh, their version of uh, We Are The Champions aimed at really celebrating frontline health workers that benefited us. And they, all these groups came to us or came to the UN and then and they said, how can we help? And we said, do what you do, because we, you have an authentic voice and your own audiences, and we can't tell you what to do because it won't be authentic. So that's the key, meet people where they are, make it a true partnership so that you do what you do best, which is the storytelling and creating the content that resonates, and we do what we do best, which is actually helping you understand what are the issues, how do you talk about them, What's that interface between, you know, that, 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 that intimidatingly brilliant UN building and the people who work there and the audiences who want to be connected to making a difference in the world. Uh, and that's what uh, colleagues like Maha and Danny and Carlos Islam, who's on the line as well, the Creative Communities Outreach Initiative at the UN, that the UN Foundation is part of. And that's what the UN Foundation, that's what we try and do. Bridge that gap between people who want to make a difference in the world, in many cases who already are, and uh, the UN that is helping to guide our understanding of how to make that difference through things like the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you, Rajesh, and thank you, Mara. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time for our segment, but I do want to express appreciation for the wonderful work that you all do at the UN and the UN Foundation. Uh, and I'm going to introduce uh, my uh, fellow uh, PGA uh, Task Force uh, colleague and uh, uh, the uh, lead producer on this event, uh, Anne-Marie Gillen, to take over from her segment. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very excited for this segment. This segment is now that you've seen the overview of working with the UN. We have three separate specific collaborations between networks and studios working with the UN on projects. So um, in the first segment, I'd like to uh, bring on our three speakers. We have Carlos Islam. He is the advocacy and special events uh, person in, at the Department of Global Communications. He learns how to collaborate with the creative community, celebrity advocates, and sporting organizations. Welcome, Carlos. Next, we have Danny Zabotazny, who's the Senior Director of Partnerships and Communications, or as we like to say, Danny Z, because that's a last name. <laughs> you did perfectly. Oh, thank you, good. Um, she works with content creators um, and foundations and influencers to create impact. Uh, she's a filmmaker herself, so she really knows and understands what we're all up against. And she happens to be the founding executive producer of Hollywood Habitat for Humanity. Welcome, Danny. And our third speaker today will be Trey Calloway. And uh, we're going to be specifically drilling down into the project that he was co-EP and writer on, which is NBC's Revolution. 
And um, he and I go way back. We had two very important firsts that we shared together as young filmmakers. Uh, we got our first TV series on the air called Mercy Point. It was ER in space. And the second Ooh. major first we had was it was the first show to be canceled that season. <laughs> <laughs> I welcome Trey. Before Thank we drill you. down with, with Trey, Carlos, why don't you give us a quick overview of the three areas that we're going to be focusing on now, working with the United Nations in the case study segment. Yeah, uh, thanks, Anne-Marie. The, I mean, yeah, so, so there are three main ways we work with the creative community uh, and the film and television industry um, mostly. And um, the one is, the first one is how we worked with Trey and um, Revolution, which was on NBC, is um, trying to, you know, help with development in the script um, when it comes to the real issues that the UN um, works on the ground through. Uh, the second is um, on location filming, which I think we'll get on to with uh, Madam Secretary. And then, so, you know, obviously productions can film at, at the UN when it's appropriate and relevant. And then finally is um, working with filmmakers on, on campaigns um, using their film or the assets of the, um, the, of the, of the TV show or the, the actors that um, appear in the show. Great, thanks Carlos. So Trey, why don't we jump in with you? Why don't you give us a summary of what led to the involvement of the UN? I know that season one into season two, there were a lot of significant changes. Yes, well, you know, Revolution, uh, as mentioned, was a science fiction series. It was created by Eric Kripke, which he produced with Bad Robot for Warner Brothers and NBC. It took place in this post-apocalyptic near future of the year 2027, which at the time seemed really far ahead. but. Uh, uh, in our series, it was 15 years after the start of a worldwide permanent electrical power blackout. And, and in the show, the, the, the sort of fallout from that kind of energy poverty affected every aspect of American life. The government had collapsed. The country was split into these autonomous republics with militias controlling the food supply. And it was a situation where there was confusion and panic and fear that left everyone feeling powerless. It was just super uplifting <laughs> but uh but uh but the heroes of our story were you know always trying to fight this good fight right they were trying to figure out in a variety of literal and and metaphorical ways in every episode how to restore their power and so in 2013 and 14 when as you say we were launching the second season of the series which shot entirely on location in austin texas we found out that the un was launching a series of these sustainable development goals that included an initiative that was promoting a, you know, a decade of sustainable energy. And, and suddenly it seemed like, wow, they're trying to accomplish the same thing in reality that we were trying to accomplish through fantasy. And, and thankfully uh, the powers that be got us all together. And we realized this perfect opportunity to work as creative partners toward trying to achieve both of those goals. That's excellent. Danny, why don't you talk to us about your role as Senior Director of Partnerships? How do you find these opportunities and what are you looking for? So I, I work closely with Maher and Carlos and Jan um, on sort of scoping different things up. For Revolution, it was actually interesting because we were working on sustainable energy for all and it was, you know, one in five people in the world actually do not have access to energy. So we were trying to find ways to engage the creative community, sort of lift that story up and understand it. And I was in LA and seeing billboards as we did when we used to drive around to go places. Uh, <laughs> and there, I, there was a billboard and it said, when the lights go out, I looked this up, power is everything. And then another one that said, 15 years after the blackout, power is everything. And I was going, what is this show? Like we have to somehow get involved. So. I would start, I found that it was Bad Robot, started doing a little stalking, and we happened to have, um, a, as Maher mentioned, we went in a normal world, try to get the UN teams uh, out to the LA every so often, and so we had a great team that was coming out, um, an Undersecretary General from Ocean named Valerie Amos, and we were building out what that program could look like, and so through a friend, got a contact at, at Bad Robot, and they were just setting up Good Robot, which was intended to tell these stories. And so it seemed like a perfect partnership opportunity. They weren't looking to take on a lot, but we said, with this really specific request, you have this TV show, we have this initiative, 
we would really love to, to have a meeting. And they set a meeting with JJ Abrams, Eric Kripke, um, the, the UN team and uh, Kat, Katie McGrath and their, their good robot team and really took a deep dive in. And, and that's, that's kind of, I was a producer, as you mentioned, ran a production company for 10 years. And so my job is to sort of help on, on some of the legwork to figure out where can we go deep um, and sort of start to tease out the opportunities with the with the creative community, and this right. one was just a home run from the from the start with the people being so willing and and the issue being so um, so perfectly spot on. Excellent, Danny. Why don't we talk a little bit? And anyone can answer this. Certainly, you know what some of the logistics of working. Did you have? Um, advisors in the writer's room? Did they have approval over the scripts and at what point and how did all that work? Uh, well, I can certainly speak to um, the way we worked together. Uh, it was in some cases in person, um, also via video conferencing, um, uh, telephone conversations, and, and getting this opportunity to to hear directly from UN negotiators and activists and experts, uh, Dirk Saga and uh, Amani Salah and, and Pernille Ironside. I think probably the first thing that as writers we recognize is that you obviously can't work at the UN unless you have a really cool name. And, uh, <laughs> and Carlos and Donnie are, are perfect evidence of that. But, but honestly, to, to be able to you know, so much of the storytelling that we were doing was not just about energy poverty, but it was it was about how all of the fallout from from that central issue, uh, you know, battling warlords and disease outbreaks and refugee camps and authoritarian leaders who were forcibly conscripting child soldiers into combat. And so to be able to connect directly with those negotiators and activists and experts uh, on the line and and hear sometimes frankly harrowing accounts of their very real negotiations with actual warlords or stopping kidnappings or dealing with uh, uh, typhus and polio outbreaks or overcrowded refugee camps in these far flung places, whether it was you know uh, Sudan or or Darfur or Yemen or Syria or the 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 People's Republic of Congo, all of that extraordinary information started to have very quickly a really major creative impact on the kinds of issues that we were forcing our characters, our fictional characters, to try and tackle in this little Texas town. Well, great, Trey. Danny and um, um, uh, Carlos, besides the, what Trey was just explaining, working with the writers um, and all of that, what other aspects did you coordinate with NBC to outreach? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously we do, we, work on these collaborations to get something out of it for, for our own communications as well as to help the productions be um, have some you know reality in the show so as, as uh, Trey said you know in season two there were, were refugee camps there were child soldiers um, there was a disease outbreak and, and all of that was um, informed by the by the UN staff um, you know who had experience those things and work on those issues in the field and, and what we were able to do then first with Bad Robot and the production was to before um, an episode would appear a few days before they would send me the episode and we'd look at the issue that was coming up and we were able this is you know very early on in our social media um, work but we were able to um, put out social media messaging and um, write a blog on how the fiction in revolution um, meets the reality on the ground. Um, so that was one way of raising awareness. And of course, also, you know, the millions of viewers every week who watch revolution saw these issues and NBC had a dedicated website to the relationship with revolution and the UN. So some of that audience were being driven to, to the issues, to our sites and to the, the blogs we were, um, we were creating. Um, and Trey mentioned the the premiere of season episode one of season two at the UN, where we had um, Eric Kripke, Steve Tao from um, Bad Robot, Trey, and three of the the main actors from the show, um, Giancarlo Esposito and um, Tracy Spiridakos and Billy Burke. So you know, ha having their presence drew um, a media. Uh, 
you know, right. to our collaboration, but also to the issues that the show was covering and, and what it means to us. And, yeah. and then the last great thing um, that um, we didn't expect, and, and it was you know, thanks to UN Foundation as well, there's um, in the season two DVD package, there was um, a short documentary about the collaboration with the UN. So all of that, you know, helped raise awareness of, um, you know, of the issues that are in the show that we, right. we at the UN are working on. Excellent. Danny, did you want to add any last thing? I was going to say the other piece that was great is they were filming in Austin. So part of the footage you saw when Carlos and I were down there is at South by Southwest. We were able uh, to do that they were, I mean, Trey is obviously fantastic and they were such a great team that they helped us to tell the bigger story of using revolution as an example, but, but how we could how we could actually create these partnerships. So we did two different panels at South by um, as part of a plus social good thing that the UN Foundation was doing with the UN there. And, uh, and NBC and, and Warner Brothers also were really fantastic partners in, like Carlos said, a website, but also doing an end card for the final episode, which was not a small thing to get them to agree to, but you know, both Bad Robot and the executives over there really, the, the hearts were so willing um, and the writers were so gracious and everybody, it was a quick yes from the beginning to this would make the show better. And so there were so many opportunities that, that naturally evolved in that way that um, I think set a template for a lot of what we've done since when we say, oh, we should do these things because individual people on those teams came up with great additional ideas of ways that they could um, take this fact versus fiction piece into the world. Excellent. Well, thank you, Trey, Carlos, and Danny. Hopefully you can stay for Q&A. And I know Carlos and Danny, you're coming back for another segment. And now let's move on to our second segment. Um, and this will be filming on location. And um, we have two guest speakers, Jan Herbertson, who is the manager, Creative Community Outreach Initiative and Messenger of Peace Program, Department of Global Communications at the United Nations. Welcome, Jan. Thank you, Emily. And, you know, and we also have uh, Lori McCurry, who is the executive producer of Madam Secretary, and we'll be drilling down on that today, as well as the CEO of Revelations. And she and I share a wonderful first as well. We produced a film together and got to walk up the red carpet at Cannes for its premiere. And since then, she has deftly and successfully grown Revelations into a powerhouse mini many production company and their focus has been impact and truth. I am honored to have you, Lori, in our inaugural UN panel. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Anne-Marie. So um, why don't we start with you, Lori? How did it come about shooting at the UN? Was it part of the storyline and development in the TV Bible? Um, was it an opportunity that just arose? Um, well, I think doing a show about the Secretary of State, you always wish that you might have access to the UN, especially that General Assembly room. We didn't think we would get access to it. We were told that only one film had ever gotten access to it and it was very hard. So we basically wrote a script with it in, knowing that we could fake it with digital or whatever, but there's nothing like standing in the middle of that general assembly room. And so we were praying that, um, that we'd get through the approvals to, to get um, permission to do it. And the, I have to say that the um, staff at the UN were really amazing in terms of production because you know, we're always on last minute and on a film, you know, television production, we had eight days and we had to fit everything within a certain time frame and also work with them. And their um, film team there really knows what it takes to put these kind of things together. Excellent. Jan, from the UN's point of view, what was the procedure to get permission and why let Madam Secretary use the General Assembly? Well, you know, um, I think when we're evaluating projects that come our way, there are primarily two things that we look at. One is, you know, does the project help raise awareness of the work of the UN, the global issues that we're working on? Uh, so, you know, we wouldn't normally take on a project where it's conceived of as an anonymous back backdrop. Uh, there has to be some relevance to the UN. Secondly, you know, whether the UN is fairly and accurately represented. And, you know, 
of course, you know, we realize that creative people need to be allowed to take creative license, you know, to tell a compelling story. But we also want to just ensure that we don't put out a distorted image of what the UN is all about, which mm -hmm. would obviously be counterproductive for us. So in the case of Madam Secretary, it's really, you know, the ideal scenario where the subject matter of the show is so directly related to the work of the organization, you know, international affairs, diplomacy, all the things that make the organization work. Um, and on top of that, the issue that was at the center of that episode, uh, terrorism, uh, was of course something that the UN is dealing with. But I just want to add, that doesn't mean that we don't work on other kinds of collaboration where the thematic, maybe substantive link is not as, as strong. I mean, we've worked with reality shows like uh, Amazing Race, uh, Project Runway All-Stars, which, you know, don't seem like a perfect fit at first sight, but we saw those uh, two as opportunities really to raise the profile of the brand, so to speak. Sure. Uh, you know, the fundamental idea that the UN is this place where nations and cultures uh, come together and you know science fiction transformers filmed in the general assembly for example so we have a wide uh, variety of projects that we've well, great on. So let's talk about some of the logistics what were the restrictions you mentioned a little bit about, about the timing um obviously you had a lot of extras script approval process just all that stuff the script approval process was interesting. Um, in scripted TV, you know, you start with a story arena and then an outline and then a script. So we sent them over to the, um, the UN team as we got them, always just praying that they weren't gonna like mark it up and send it back with something that we couldn't do. Um, very few remarks from them other than making sure that they knew where we were thinking of shooting certain pieces of it. I had no idea the amount of locations inside the actual UN building. I think we've all seen the General Assembly, 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 but there's a lot of really amazing places that we were also able to shoot and they really helped us hone in on what we could do. We had a short day. We had to, um, we shot the lobby scene um, very first up because they needed to open the lobby to the people that came in to work because it was a working day on a Friday and we had to be in and out with crew, with crew and all of our equipment out by 10 a.m. Um, for the first two shots. So that was a bit of a timing craziness. Um, the good and the bad is they're very uh, clear about what you need to do. You have to come in with your ID. You have to come in um, already having been pre-screened. Um, and I remember a long line of our crew with their carts, like at seven o'clock in the morning in the back, going through and getting everything screened so that they could go in. So in terms of the production of the production from the UN standpoint to us, it was really seamless. They really helped us make sure that we could get in and out in a timely manner. But we did have some restrictions and no food. We had to bring in, everyone had to bring in kind of a boxed lunch that we, uh, we didn't have an official lunch that day. Oh, the crew must have been happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things, I was, just one of the things that I remember happening is that we thought, oh, we're going to have like 325 extras that day, background and all that. And then we were researching and then looked up and I think the General Assembly, assembly um, is it, 2,000 that it fits. I think it's 2,000 capacity. A, a little under 2,000. I, yeah. I it yeah. So yeah. it's and so oh, wow. we were we basically dressed to camera. So if anyone has seen it or or sees the episode, we were literally juggling people this way, juggling people that way. And the big wide shot was literally an, a VFX shot where we had spliced together either side. So it was quite a. It was, it was, it was fun. It was really fun. You know, in producing, you like to hit, hit those um, issues that are always going to give you a little bit of like, wow, how do we do this? <laughs> it was season two, episode 20, if people want yes. to. Yes, yes. I think yes. it was a two-parter. So it's the second yeah. part of the, uh, of a two-parter. Well, Jan, how early? I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of logistics to play with here. So how early should one begin the process to secure UN as a location? Well, I think the logistical preparation went really well, you know, through the typical thing, the location and tech scouts, which were the first steps as soon as we had sort of the green light to proceed on the project. 
you know, the, but parallel to that, we have the legal process, which is, oh, that. you know, <laughs> not, the, not the fun part of the, this work, but, you know, the lo lo negotiation of a location agreement. And that does tend to take a little bit of time just because of the nature of the UN as an international organization. So the language and the provisions in our agreements tend to be a bit different than what US productions are used to. So it, you know, it takes a bit of back and forth, but you know, it's very rare that we don't get to the finish line, but it can take a little bit of time. So we like to, you know, give ourselves five to six weeks uh, lead time, you know, starting five, six weeks out uh, to be comfortable, but that doesn't mean that we haven't done it in a shorter period of time. We have certainly done that, particularly with the TV series, mm -hmm. which work on a sort of a tighter budget. Yeah. <laughs> well, timeline rather <laughs> um okay one last thing from either of you what worked what didn't work and what might you do differently give some insights to our attendees i mean wow from our really from our point of view it worked extremely well uh the whole process preparation i i don't recall any major issues it was a lot of work to prepare but everything went smoothly on and, and like you know laurie said it, it just like a greased wheel um i think uh, it would have been great to just do more <laughs> to follow up on that with with yeah. some more collaboration and maybe take greater advantage of, of what we did to to raise awareness of the issues around it but uh the process itself was great really yeah. Um, I have, uh, I think that it, it, it's not that it didn't work, but I would do it differently. We had five cameras and our first shot was an establishing shot, that beautiful UN that we've all seen with the flags. What we didn't, and we thought we'd just pop it off and run in. And what we didn't expect was that, you know, the flags are kind of like this, unless there's wind. Uh -huh. So my guys, and this was one, a camera that had to go inside. So my guys were sitting there for, I don't know how long. And finally it tiny little breeze came and we got it but you know you want that big great so i would yeah. say make sure that you you either have permission to come back later or keep a camera there and throw your other cameras inside so i would have gotten and one extra camera because right when we went inside the wind just picked up and we were like oh. um, at least it wasn't think, raining <laughs> no yes thank goodness because then the flags don't go up so we were lucky in that sense. <laughs> oh, i didn't know that that's interesting well, thank you for the for for helping us with that. the The thing I think that really worked is there. Well, for us, there's such a we portray public servants in film and entertainment. You know, the most we can do is accurately portray Jan and Melissa and all these wonderful people that do real public service and that do it for real. And so, for us, it was just a beautiful. Um, connection to be able to I remember our crew members going up to every single person that was coming into work that day and thanking them for the service that they do for our country because it's such a they do so much behind the scenes so it's really like the best part was really being able to look them in the eyes and say thank you for the work that they're doing on our behalf much of it that goes unseen so Amory thank you for putting getting a little emotional thank you for putting this together because it's so important for us to be able to know how we can shine a light on these really important issues and really important public service. Wonderful. Well, thank you both. Hopefully you can stay around for Q&A. And we'll now shift into our final segment of working with the UN. And this is all about campaigns. So I'm going to bring back Carlos Islam again and Danny Z. And um, our third speaker will be Joanne Gunsberg, who is the Director of Environmental Sustainability at Sony Pictures Entertainment. So I'd like to start with the clip first. So as we talk, we've got a real good context about what we're looking at. So Diane, if you could do the clip. So cute. So <laughs> why don't we start with Danny this time? Danny, how did the connection happen with Sony on this campaign? So I mentioned earlier that we would do UN delegation trips. So Maher and Carlos Jan came out to LA and we were putting together a trip and went to the Sony lot. And the first time we went, Michael Linton, the chairman at the time, hosted kind of a high level meeting and then a ton of different executives to do some broad exposure on 
what does the UN do and why would Sony value this? It's, you know, getting into global partnerships, stable markets matter to, you know, to studios, et cetera, but really kind of opened the door for conversations. And so John Rigo and Joanne um, were either in that meeting or quickly became uh, close allies. And we started talking a lot about sustainability and different ways that we could work together. And they kind of scouted out across the system where might there be some opportunities and set up a meeting with their head of publicity, uh, Susan Vonderwerf, Von, Von um, and kind of ran through the slate. And we ran through, you know, the sustainable development goals that you all, you know, so we have tattooed on our arm, but um, are the kind of high level, these 17 goals. And they ran through their film slate and we started to brainstorm on where could we meet and you know, it's really unique and, and wonderful, uh, not unique, I should say, there are, there are other great opportunities you've seen today. Um, but when you have, um, when you have partners who say, what are the important things you're working on right now? What are you trying to do? And we said, you know, we're really trying to reach young people on climate. There's some really important moments coming up and we're trying to mobilize. And that was kind of the seed that became, well, we have the angry birds. And if the angry birds were happy over the planet and a lot of different creative back and forth with with Maher and, and Carlos and Jan and team and, and the Sony teams to find what's good for the movie, what's good for the issue that created this really expansive um, campaign to get young people involved in in promoting um, climate, climate action. Excellent. Carlos, did you want to add anything to that? Were there any other goals about that campaign? Um, other goals? I mean, it, it, it was a uh... I mean, we'd moved on it's a few years after the revolution collaboration and our social media presence had advanced quite rapidly. And by the time we, we started work with Sony and on Angry Birds. So, um, I mean, the, the main goal for that campaign was to, to reach people, you know, online and, uh, and digitally. And, we, and I think we, you know, we had a great success with that. I and mean, we can talk more about that uh, when you're ready. Okay, Joanne, uh, so talk to us about why Sony's interested in working with the UN. You know, how does it make sense for a big corporation, shareholder driven for Sony? What did they gain? Um, well, first of all, it's great working with Danny and Carla. So <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really um, an easy, it's an easy collaboration. But overall, taking a step back, um, Sony Pictures rolls into Sony Corp and Sony has something called the Road to Zero which is a plan for a zero environmental footprint by 2050. So that's, you know, we roll up into this larger goal. And one of the things that Sony Pictures, um, we're storytellers, as Lisa all talked about, um, our goal in that big picture is to bring awareness, um, to raise awareness um, around issues of sustainability and the environment. And then um, in concert with that, we also have a commitment to the SDGs. And as people have said, like they're cool, they're fun, and they're really accessible. Um, so it's a, it's a really, um, it aligns with our corporate goals. Um, so it, that's on, on a real top level. And then, you know, from a, from a brass tax level, from um, a marketing point of view and a publicity point of view, first of all, our filmmakers and our talent, they, they really care about these issues as well. Um, so it's a really, it's a really authentic way for us to work with our talent. Um, and then, you know, I, we, Melissa talked about it as well. I mean, the reach of the, of the United Nations is, is incredible. Um, we really get an opportunity for our global offices to interact with their agencies. Um, it's just an incredible, incredible network. And it's a really opportunity for our um, teams to bring, you know, we've talked about bringing awareness to them, but we get to bring our, you know, our films and movies to a new audience as well around the world that may, may not have intersected. So there's a lot of kind of from a corporate level, from our just a pure marketing level, and then, you know, and we've all talked about reach and it's just kind of, we talk about like the double bottom line, but I think, you know, we have our goals and we, and we continue to work with Danny and team on bringing awareness to the sustainable development goals. And this was just like a really just solid fit to, to, um, to work on this campaign. So, so uh, any one of you, what were some of the ways that the campaign was marketed? I know you talked about buses and Times Square and different things like that. So. Um, Sony was full of surprises. I feel we built a, there were three PSAs that we did, one with the Secretary General of Ki Moon at the time um, that got tr tremendous reaction. There were, it was key art around with unique character actions that Red was taking. 
um, all around the world, different sustainable actions that was created. There were two different one sheets that were used. And then those, yes, were, I was getting calls. I know Carlos and, and team two of, you know, there was this bus that just went by in Paris that has this, that, this push on it. There's billboards in Times Square. Um, there was a, an event at the UN that Carlos can talk more about. Um, but we, uh, they, they did 20 events. They built, they were doing a marketing campaign already and they built in, in 20 different countries events um, that, that highlighted the campaign as well. So it was a, it was a real great matchup because it was, it didn't have to take off as a CSR initiative. It very much built into where they were at for marketing and, and was an ad play. What does CSR stand for? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, corporate social responsibility. So a lot of times I think people think um, this would fall into a charity bucket and the work that we all do is, is really not that that bucket. Um, it can be in partnership and we do that as well, but it, it works equally well um, in this way where really we worked with the sustainability team and the publicity team, the marketing team. Um, and I, I'd say for us, it worked really well for the publicity and marketing team they were incredible allies and put in a lot of man hours and incredible creativity. Um, and I think had a really positive experience uh, as well, but it was, um, it was, it was a lot put in, but Carlos, what am I missing? Um, no, I mean, the, the, when this project first came to us through, um, through Danny, um, we kind of thought, what, what do we have to do with the, with the angry birds? You know, it didn't initially, you know, intuitively makes sense but then you know when when the idea came that you know we, we want to help celebrate the international of happiness by making the angry birds happy which sounded kind of catchy but but with everyone taking action on climate change um but that was the the idea was to get people to take action on cl climate change against climate change and that would make the angry birds happy that was the the catch for the for the campaign and um Sony really put a, you know, a hell of a lot of resources behind that. They, um, they, they built a website where people could log um, their actions that they were taking through the campaign and it was turning the, um, the world from red to green. We were, you know, the idea was to get, turn the, the globe green. Um, you know, as Danny mentioned, they, um, we co-created these uh, PSAs um, you know, that, that had enormous reach. Um, and the Secretary General gave a, you know, um, did a PSA with a green screen that Sony then added on the Angry Birds to, and it, that got 415,000 views on the UN wow. YouTube site alone, which for us is is pretty big, and um, you know, over 8,000 retweets and shares and likes, and so you know that, that's that's big for us. And this was, you know, now five years ago almost, and um, yeah, that, so you know, and then. They used, instead of having um, the actors sit in a hotel room and the, the media, entertainment media going to them and asking them questions about the film, they brought them all to the UN and they built this huge, what we call a green carpet. Um, and we had on the green carpet, we had the, you know, Jason Stakers, Maya Rudolph and Josh Gad, but also some UN uh, climate change experts, the Secretary General at the time, the, uh, the Secretary General. Uh, and they brought the, um, you know, the media that would have um, would have been at the hotel there you know, talking about the film. So it was it was a, a huge event at the UN, the red carpet. But then, in the G general assembly hall, um, the actors and our on secretary general and the climate change expert spoke to um, a room full of model UN students, like eight, almost eighteen hundred UN students, mm. uh, uh, not UN students. Sorry. Uh, 1800 students who are doing a model UN and um, you know so this translated into a hundred I think like 138 um, TV, uh, news TV broadcasts around the world who carried just that story of the Angry Birds being at the UN working on climate change so it was you know it was a it was a huge campaign and um, mm -hmm. for us it was the, the first of its kind Excellent. Well, why don't we end with one last question for Joanne. Um, do you have a model for measuring and quantifying, you know, that this work, you want to do it again, what you might do differently? Yeah. Um, I, you know, usually it's a, in a traditional marketing way, we look at impressions and reach. So 
Mm -hmm. I mean, as Carla said, like the, the reach was incredible. Um, I think we were at over, over 800 million impressions. So I think for everybody, it was, it was, a, it was a huge success. And that's, you know, a chance. And then uh, one more point, you know, for Sony, it, it goes on TV, it goes on social. There were events around the world. And then Red got to be the international, honorary international ambassador of green. So for, for Rovio and them, like that's amazing. And um, so I wanted to add that in. But yeah, so measurement of success is really is, is reach and awareness and for both the goals and the money. And the Excellent. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. And um, I just want to kind of do a quick summary statement before we hand it over to Rebecca for our final uh, segment on Q&A. But uh, actually, Maher had referenced this earlier back in 2011 reaching out to writers and directors and producers, all of us that are on right now to incorporate issues in movies and television and social media, that was new. And then, then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon swept into Los Angeles pitching, I need your support. You have the power and influence to send millions and billions of people around the world. Together, we can have a blockbuster impact on the world. So this virtual event today is the beginning of strengthening that ongoing relationship to empower the creative community with the UN expertise and influence to change these important issues worldwide. Um, and if uh, Diane, if you'd put in the chat again, the UN materials, their flow chart and their creative community outreach, that would be great, the links. So I'm gonna hand it over for our last segment here for Q&A to Rebecca Graham Ford, who will moderate. She is a co-founder of the Social Impact Entertainment Task Force, PJ Education Committee co-chair, and the Television Academy Producers Peer Group Executive Committee. So we're all in good hands for this final segment on our Q&A and hopefully who's ever still here of our speakers will come back on and we will have some questions for you. Thanks, Rebecca. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much. This has been incredible. I've been taking as many notes as I can as a producer and a writer. I think one of the big questions for everyone on this panel today is the nuts and bolts of how do we get uh, the attention of the UN with our projects? What is the most effective way to reach out to you? What kind of information are you looking for in this initial outreach? Um, you know, just give us some nuts and bolts for a minute. How do we get your attention and how do we get a project moving forward very quickly? I'm going to ask, um, let's see, Carlos. I'm going to defer Maybe? to Matt here. <laughs> are we, are you still here? I am, I am. Thanks. Okay. I mean, look, uh, times have changed. Times have changed from, from maybe a couple of years ago until now. And of course, today, because of the pandemic and limitations on access to the building. So, so those issues now, of course, impact our ability to, to address those issues. Today, also, people are, everybody's mind is about the pandemic and COVID and, and, and that kind. So to do something that ignores this now and to focus on something that may not relate to today's reality uh, could not probably have buy-in. I mean, Carlos and Jan spoke about some of the difficulties with OLA and then getting the, the negotiating, believe me, negotiating those things internally are more difficult for us and, 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 and have been possible because we had the support of the Secretary General at the time, Ban Ki-moon, who said, you know, I support this, I see the value in it, and, and we leveraged that uh, to, to convince colleagues uh, in, in collaboration, whether it's Department of Security, uh, Logistics, and, and, and so on. Today, the challenge in filming at the UN itself is, is also to do, and, I'm, and I put that in the chat comment, is of course most productions want to do it on the weekday because it's it's more less expensive and that puts us uh with the need to have the building available for staff and for work and we cannot really take the general assembly or another room if member states want to meet in it so if filming at the weekend and the interpreter by the way was filmed entirely uh at the weekend three different weekends so weekend is easier if you want to film at the UN rather than a weekday. 
plus there are costs involved that of course had to be covered and that comes into the location agreement because not because we charge anything, there is no location charge. It's actually because staff would have to work overtime and so on and so forth. But how do you come to us with a project that is timely today and that is relevant, that a project that isn't necessarily focused on one country because we represent and we work with 195 countries, uh, 193 members and two uh, observers at the UN and, and we cannot be seen as producing or helping something that is targeting one specific country uh, and or, or, or you know, impar not impartial, the opposite of part impartial. So uh, as, as, as civil international civil servants, these are the criteria that we have to work with, but things that are timely, that are relevant to what, what we are doing now that align with either the vision of the sustainable development goals, human rights, uh, climate action, climate change. So. So these are the kinds of collaborations. And, and one aspect that I think didn't come through is of course, another element is actually screening at the UN. I mean, we have organized several screenings uh, at the UN of films, uh, whether 12 Years a Slave or Selma and organized uh, talkbacks with the directors and, and, and people in the production to, to, to show, to bring the issue and how it relates to what is on the UN's agenda. Um, and, and of course, uh, you all know that 12 Years a Slave won the Oscar because it was screened at the UN two days before. <laughs> so. Well, that leads me into my next question. In terms of being a content creator, it, are there resources to us to, to check our work, to make sure that we're being the most accurate with the UN? Say we're either in, obviously in the development phase, that's the best time to be talking with you, but down the road, is there any sort of resources in terms of uh, reviewing a, a TV show, a script, a, a film, maybe ready, or an impact campaign. Are those kind of resources out there for us as well? Um, I would assume that the best is to get us get you involved as early as possible, but do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, we do. I mean, uh, sometimes, I mean, either we can answer directly or we can provide access to resources within the United Nations, whether it's a website with the specificities or access to our own archives of film, video, and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and more so through uh, recruiting and not recruiting physically, but bringing on board experts from the UN, as you saw uh, Bahare uh, in, in one of the short films with Carlos, who's a climate change expert uh, to, to talk uh, or uh, somebody like Derek Sager, uh, Trey mentioned who, who, who has worked and negotiated with uh, war, warlords, the release of children. So we can actually discuss that and, and in the same way that we do in other areas of work. I mean, many people's first touch uh, experience with the UN is through a model United Nations. Modern UNs aren't actually simulating the UN because they they follow different rules of procedure. They they have a different leadership structure. So what we have tried is like, listen, guys, come and talk to us. We can tell you how it's done. And we we just published a book on about how to do that. Uh, so the the CCUI colleagues, Jan and Carlos and and Danny, of course, and and others, uh, are in this business. So touch, get in touch with us. Uh, I think our emails, I put our emails in the chat and these can be shared. Uh, we will help you and guide you where you can get more resources from the UN. Uh, and if it's not us, it's somebody else in, in another UN agency, we'll, we'll bring them on board. Um, Trey and Lori, I'm wondering if you are inspired to do more projects with the UN after this morning, but also to what did you do with, you know, we've all been through the network note process. We've all been through that, that bigger, um, um, sometimes we get a little pushback on topics and things. Did you guys have any specific moments where you really needed to lean on your UN partners to say, hey, this is correct or, or in anything in terms of your Madam Secretary work? I think sometimes uh, networks get a little nervous about things. I'm just wondering if you had experiences like that. Um, well, on Madam Secretary, we had a great partner in CBS Studios. They were, um, they also have a, an eye towards social, uh, especially with our show, they wanted to make sure that we were hitting um, uh, important social 
issues, just the fact that they greenlit a show with the female secretary of state to go on prime time was a big, uh, a big um, commitment to that. And what they were, what they were most concerned when we were shooting at the UN is that we, we made sure that we had the legal agreement, as Jan said, that, that we ran it past CBS and there was nothing that was going to prevent them from distributing it the way that they would want to. So from the creative standpoint, though, um, CBS was really great. We, we had a group on the side um, called Glover Park that gave us some really amazing information and things that we never would have thought of um, to make sure that even some of the language that you use when you're at the General Assembly or when you're at addressing the whole General Assembly. So, they, so we had a little help beforehand and then we sent it to the UN um, Film Com uh, Council and they helped us further with that. Okay. Yeah, I would say, you know, it was a, another great thing about our partnership with the UN was timing because, you know, in our first season of Revolution, we were shooting in Wilmington, North Carolina. And, um, you know, uh, I think it would be fair to say that that first season, even though it, we, we were presenting a dystopian uh, post-apocalyptic view of, of the country and the world, it was a little glossier then in our second season where we made every effort to sort of make things feel more gritty and more authentic to uh, the central premise of the show. And, and that's where to sort of echo Lori's sentiment, but from my perspective, as one of the writers, you know, our executives at both Warner Brothers and at NBC sort of wanted us to lean into that which felt more authentic. And so it really helped us then uh, with the notes process or in their, in our creative collaborations with them to be able to say on occasion, you, you know, uh, this might've been the way we would approach it, but the UN has sort of pushed us in, in a more authentic direction. So, I mean, to be clear, look, as storytellers, it's our job to entertain and thrill an audience with every episode, but, but we felt like as writers, the UN really also in that process helped keep us a little bit more honest than we had been previously. And so it was a very successful collaboration in that regard as well. A couple of folks have reached out in terms of how you might help a, a film or a short film or piece of content get out into the world. Is that something you get on board with after the fact once something is already produced? I know we talked about the screening series and things like that, but you know, there's smaller projects too out there in the world, mobile projects, things like that. Are there, are there any limitations in terms of what you might consider to help push the message if it's a message you agree with? I mean, the, the exactly. I mean, alignment of messages is, is critical, but also because we are an organization, just I, I'm sorry to harp on this piece, because we, we, we really have to avoid being uh, seen in a position where one or two or three ambassadors would go and complain that how dare you show this or so so the political sensitivity is critical so we never show something without actually fully seeing it but when there's alignment at the moment also because of the restrictions on access and restrictions on on, on costs within the un if a screening doesn't happen at the un it can also happen uh, outside for a, a number of years actually we had a collaboration with the uh, independent uh, production in uh, IP, what is it, uh, Carlos? Uh, independent Inter Filmmaker Project. In oh. Independent Filmmaker Project. Uh, we had several screenings uh, outside in a different venue, but also bringing new and experts and bringing and linking this, the, the connectivity, the, the, the film with the e issue and how it fits in the bigger picture. And the other advantage today, and Carlos alluded to that, is that when we started this, our social media presence as an organization was very small. Today, we, we have a substantial presence on social media, whether it's Twitter, we have like 13 million followers, Instagram, Facebook, uh, even TikTok. The first day the UN uh, opened a TikTok account, it had 7 million views. So, so we can also push that aspect of it. And for a number of years, and I think this is another aspect we did not speak about, the UN is full of stories. I mentioned that. So we have been working for nine years now with David Raymond, uh, who was one of the first to pick up the offer of stories from the UN to, to do features and, and film. Uh, it started out with a product a production uh, idea, something called In Harm's Way. 
And we collected uh, dozens of stories of colleagues and situations where people in, in the UN working in the field, not in the tall imposing building in New York. You know, people working in peacekeeping missions, working people in, in either uh, in, in moderate, uh, moderating a peace process or uh, helping East Timor become independent and build a story around that. Like, you, I mean, recently, I think Netflix launched Sergio, which is a film based on the life and, uh, and, and eventual uh, death of Sergio uh, Vera Di Mello, who was uh, the head of the UN's mission in Iraq, who was killed with 21 other colleagues in Baghdad, 19 August, this month. Actually, we, we celebrated or we marked, we, we, we honored the memory of the 22 colleagues who were killed by Al-Qaeda in, in, in Iraq at the time. Uh, the first time the UN was targeted was 19 August uh, 2003. And that has become the World Humanitarian Day. So we do have many stories. We are happy to share those. And if, if your film is already done, talk to us still. We can find ways to collaborate and, and use it as a source uh, or as a resource for other activities and events. Can I just add on, on the question of distribution, we have to walk this fine line of not being seen as promoting a commercial product. Um, so, you know, if there's a collaboration with the campaign or, you know, the writer's room, then, you know, we can talk about that collaboration and do things like that. But um, distributing the actual film or TV show is trickier. Um, Another option, just to mention, the UN Foundation has several campaigns, Girl Up, UNA, United Nations Association of America, and they have done some um, interesting collaborations with documentaries where they've done screenings for their members, and they've done some virtually recently. We did something actually with Sergio, um, with the director, and so there are some ways, too, that are um, to collaborate with those audiences when, when the, oh, the themes align. Well, We've run 15 minutes over, and I appreciate all of you spending this extra time with us. And I would encourage everybody who's attended today, please reach out. As we've heard, the UN is open for business. They want to work with us. And I thank each and every one of you for showing up this morning, giving us your Saturday morning. Um, and we're so inspired by everything we heard today. Um, for attendees, we'll be sending you a survey to talk about future events with the UN because the great surprise to this is that we have an ongoing relationship now and we'll be talking about different topics and different ways to work with them over the course of the next coming months. And we wanna hear from the membership as to what the things you'd like to hear for, uh, from us as well. Um, and also you'll be getting uh, some of the information in terms of contact information, how to work with these wonderful people. So thank you panelists. Um, we appreciate you greatly and I wish all of you a wonderful Saturday. Thanks. Thank you all Thank for joining us. Thank you, PGA.